Welcome to this episode of PCTV, the show that takes you by the hand and leads you through the digital landscape. It's a pleasure to have you with us. I'm Nazar Rashid. I'm Jared Knapp. And today we're going to be continuing our conversation about peripherals by showing you how to connect up your printer to your wireless network so that you can print using any device wirelessly. Yeah. And then we'll also uh, have a few of our usual segments in uh, indispensables, uh, fun stuff, and our, our rather new one. What is it and, and why, why should, should you care? care? Excellent. I think you'll enjoy this episode. Yeah. So, Nazar, you're going to show us your uh, printer here. Yep. Now, this is a slightly older Canon printer. Um, the reason why I like this particular printer and haven't upgraded it is because it's got the ability to print onto DVDs. So, it's got a special little section down here. And as you can see, it can print pictures directly onto a disc as long as you've got one of those white discs. It would just print directly on there. And that's why... I love this printer and I won't be upgrading it anytime soon. That's great. Yeah. Now, the cool thing about this printer is as well, it is, although it doesn't have wireless capabilities built in, it does have, and if I just move it for a sec, you can see here on the side, this blue cable. Now this blue cable is all about ethernet and it's a network cable, as you can see there, and the little printer has got a slot specifically for it. So you plug it directly in there and um, then you can connect it up to my network. So, so that's going to be on your LAN, your local area network. That's right. So now that cable goes down and it connects up to a switch, which we'll show you right now. Okay, so now as you can see, the blue cable comes down and it actually plugs into the back of what this is. This is actually a switch. Now, unlike a router, a switch connects all of the devices in your network together. So it connects them all up, but it doesn't have an internet connection. You see, it's, it's just simply for your local area connection. So all the computers that go into here and my printer goes into here, you can see it's lit up. It's got the little light saying that it's connected and it's on and it's ready to go, right? And then uh, what that allows me to do is I've connected the switch up to my router. Now the router is over here. Okay, so now as you can see, we've talked about the switch. The switch comes into the back of my router here. You can see a blue cable. That's the network cable from the switch. It comes into my router, which with the antenna, as you can see, shows that it's, shows that it's wireless. And um, that's what we need. We need it to be a wireless router so that it means any, if you have a laptop or a tablet or anything that's wireless and it connects up to your router, well, then it means we are able to print wirelessly because for this printer, specifically, we had to put in some of the drivers to allow that to happen. A lot of them already come with that already pre-installed now. But we put in the drivers, it allows it to be seen on the network, and then if I've got a laptop that's not connected up to my switch, it's just wireless, it connects up through my wireless antenna, and the printer is immediately visible on the network, and I can print to that using whatever device I have. And that's how we make a printer which wasn't wireless to begin with, become a wireless printer. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, what we're looking at today is uh, Nazar's mailbox. Huh. So Nazar uh, runs a copy of Outlook 2003. So this might be uh, more familiar for people uh, at work because you, know, you usually use the full Outlook client at work. Uh, rather than at home, but if you have it at home or at work, this will be useful. So what we're going to do is archive uh, all items in uh, Nazar's mailbox here that were older than three years. As you can see down the bottom, yeah. it's got quite a lot of items, over 24,000 actually. Yeah, so now he's that, got... That does slow down your internet experience for your emails. Of course, I've got an SSD hard drive, so it doesn't really slow it down too much, but... There's a lot of stuff in there. Yeah, I don't need to have that many. So, what we want to do is uh, we want to get everything that's older than three years out of this central file and we'll put it in a separate 
archive PST file, which is in Outlook is called a personal folder. How do we go about doing that? So what we want to do is create a new uh, Outlook data file. All right, that comes up under the file new, and we can choose. This one is for backward compatibility, but we'll just stick with the normal. And we're asked where we want to put it. So, so we can call this whatever we want. We'll call it archive, and we hit OK. <clears throat> And we can now see that there is an archive. There's a separate folder here. That means that it uh, refers to a separate file on the computer. So if we go up to uh, the top of Nazar's mailbox, which has all the, uh, the items, we'll click folders here so that we can see them all. And uh, we should be able to now go file archive. And then we can choose to archive items older than. So now we're putting the archive into this location and we need to choose a date. So we'll go back to what, May 2011? So we're gonna go back to the 2nd of May 2011. Anything older uh, than that date will go into this new file. And we'll just hit okay. And you can see down here that it's doing its thing. That'll take a while, given that there's uh, 25,000 items in there. But you, it's starting to replicate the folders, so, you know, it's recreating the inbox down here, and you can see stuff starting to go in there, and uh, you can see that this is, in fact, older than May um, 2011. This is from here. And that'll just do its thing uh, while Outlook is running. It'll probably take a little while. Yep, you can see some more emails coming in. And then you have a separate file. So if we looked at that on the Windows file system, you can see this file is starting to grow. So this file here, this file here will be uh, the file that contains all of that folder. Well done. Thanks. So, in today's segment for fun stuff, what we're going to look at is Pandora. Now, yeah. what is Pandora? Pandora is an internet radio station that basically allows you to pick the artist, the song titles, the genre, and create a station of your favorite types of songs. Yeah, it customizes a radio station for you in the cloud. So, it's it's got an archive of all sorts of music. And it's got uh, some software that uh, categorizes it, I guess. So, you know, we've got a little bit here on the about. Yeah, for sure. We typed in Pandora.com and went to their about. And it said that uh, it started in the year 2000 uh, mm. using the Music Genome Project, which is a registered trademark. Mm. That's excellent, though. <laughs> yeah. You know, they're mapping and, music. Yeah, and it says that um, it allows you to create up to 100 unique stations which you can then refine and uh, you can put down what types of artists you like, what genre of music you like, um, and what songs that you prefer and it will find, go through and find all similar types of songs or songs from that artist or songs from that genre and, just, and create a radio station. Yeah, just kind of randomize it for you. Yeah. Yeah. So this is quite big now because it's incorporated into some vehicles. That's right. Like a lot of your new cars today because they've got such great big screens and stuff and they have like an, a full computer interface within your car hmm. will have access to Pandora in your car. So you can set up a radio station that you like with the songs that you want and play the artists that you care about. I think that's a great facility. I think it's fantastic. I think yeah. it's a really good thing. So if we went to the Pandora, which is here, uh, it says uh, you can enter the artist, the genre or composer to create a station. So let's go through the process of how to register, Okay. which is here. And as you can see, it's for free. As always, we like to definitely showcase free apps whenever we can. So this yeah. one's for free. And you just enter your email, your password, a little bit of information about yourself, Pretty and simple. yeah, and you start up. There you go. Yeah, excellent. And it's really good. So, and then once you get up and and rolling, then you can start choosing the genres, start choosing the artists, start choosing the song types that you like, and it will go through using its uh, registered music genome project to start randomizing, finding, and creating a radio station built on your specific preferences. And that's something that's really, really good. Let's have a bit of a quick look at um, 
the music genome project. Yeah. I mean, what is it? Is this a link? Yeah, it's yeah, a link. It's a link. It's a, a unique relationship with music, and it's all about your tastes. So delivering a great radio experience to each and every listener requires an incredibly broad and deep understanding of music. Apparently, the Music Genome Project was the largest analyzed project to do with music ever done. Wow. I like this line here. Each song in the Music Genome Project is analyzed using up to 450 distinct musical characteristics <laughs> wow. by a trained music analyst. So, yeah, it's quite involved. It's not just hip-hop, drum and bass, you know. Um, give it a go. Yeah, it's uh, built using a methodology that includes the use of precisely divine technology, uh, a consistent frame of reference. Yeah, sure. So what it does, I didn't even know there was 450 distinct characteristics about music, but apparently there is. Yeah. So it'll find the, the, uh, the, the similarities between the songs that you like or the artists that you choose or the genres that you've chosen and then start finding other songs based on those choices. And that's really, really good. So... Pandora. I mean, we did Spotify earlier in one of our other fun stuff, and um, Pandora is just an internet radio station, so I figure that we should definitely have um, showcased that, which we've done now. Sure. So there you go. That was our fun stuff, Pandora. Check it out. Yeah. Okay, so in this segment of What Is This and Why Should You Care?, uh, we're going to do WhatsApp. Now, Jared, tell me about WhatsApp. WhatsApp. Okay. It's a, it's a text application that crosses platforms, so uh, it doesn't care if it's an iPhone or if it's an Android or a Windows phone. So primarily smartphones? Smartphones. It's a yep. smartphone application. Okay. And uh, it allows texting, uh, uploading of videos, comments, the usual stuff we see with social media. And audio. Audio too, uh, yeah. but the main difference being it's not using your SMS service as part of your phone plan, it's using the internet. So there's a difference there. So SMS, what's SMS? Short message service. That's right. So that's what gave us the first little blocks of texts that we could do. So 160 characters. That's right. You'll receive an SMS, blah, blah, blah. So now it's the same sort of functionality, but it's using your internet. So just the same way that you leverage the internet to make uh, video calls with Skype, you now leverage the internet and uh, to, to do these other functions like texting. That sounds good. Now, what we've done is we've uh, loaded it up into Wikipedia to find out a little bit more about it for you. Mm. And um, it's got a screenshot down here, as you can see, which shows you how it works, looking well, what it looks like on a Windows phone. And uh, that's obviously the icon that'll pop up. This little icon here showing you that it's WhatsApp. Mm. And according to this, it says that uh, WhatsApp has got, for, as of April 22nd, 2014, 500 million active monthly users. Yeah. So that's quite a substantial. Yeah, quite a substantial I mean, that's why we're mentioning base. it because I, I, I personally don't use it, but 500 million people. Yeah, that, and, and it says right here that the messaging system handles more than 10 billion messages per day. Per day. That's huge that's scale. That's so massive. So if you're not onto this, I'm sure that someone that you know is. Yeah. Definitely, and I think it's um, something we should definitely have a look at because it is for smartphones. And as you all know, as we've told you, smartphones are basically small computers that fit in your palm. And um, it's always good to find out a couple of apps that we can get. Now, WhatsApp, once again, is a, a free app. Yep. Uh, we'll go to their homepage here. And what's it worth? Ah, oh, right. Well, according to Wikipedia, uh, Facebook bought WhatsApp for in February of this year, 2014, for... Nineteen billion dollars US. Nineteen billion. I don't know how they monetize it, uh, yeah, but that's, came to that figure. That's what they paid for, it, and that was the largest acquisition that Facebook had ever done to date. So, so it's a big deal. It is a big deal. So let's go to their homepage. Yeah. So here's the homepage. As you can see, it's uh, simple, personal, real-time messaging, and it also includes your location whenever you send a message. So that's something interesting to think about too. Yeah, you can have yeah. group chats. You can share locations, as I just said. And send photos and videos as well as audio. And as you can see, it goes on iPhone, Blackberry, Nokia, which is Symbian. Um, well, there's Symbian, Nokia, and Windows Phone. I think Symbian is the Samsung. Um, is it? I thought. No, no, it was Nokia, wasn't it? Yeah, Nokia. Nokia. I thought it was Symbian. Uh, was so I wonder why the S40 is there as its own specific. Well, Symbian is a, an OS in itself. Yeah, it so is. So there were other manufacturers that used it. I'm not ah. sure who owned it. I thought it was Nokia owned it. I thought Nokia owned it as well. But then Nokia, didn't they just get bought up by Google? I'm sure they did. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they did too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, or was that 
Windows that bought Nokia. I think it was Windows. No, one of them bought Motorola. Ah, Remember, right. I thought, I thought it was Microsoft bought Motorola. Right. Anyway, well, we can check I'm that. sure there's some viewers out there that could uh, check out the mergers and acquisitions and correct us. Yeah, if someone yeah. wants to send us in a text about or a little email explaining who exactly bought Nokia out of Google and Windows, then we'll be pleased to hear that. Although we could Google it right now. We could Google it right now, but you know, we're throwing something out there. Yeah, if you want to interact with us, then we'd <laughs> appreciate whatever comments you may give us. Your well thought out comments. Yeah. Okay, so what you do is you download WhatsApp to your smartphone or any tablet, but no, normally smartphones, and um, you can get going. As you can see, there's a little screenshot here showing you how it all works, and it looks really, really simple. Oh, look, and it tells you how it works. Right, and there's all the different, the different OS platforms that it works on. And uh, you download it, it's for free, they don't have ads, so uh, it's off, off you go. Yeah. So that's WhatsApp for our What Is It and Why Should You Care segment. So I hope that you enjoy that and check it out. Yeah, thanks very much. Okay, so for this segment of Indispensables, what we're gonna be looking at is your function keys. Yeah, function keys. Now, where are the function keys? They're generally at the top of the keyboard. Right across the top of the keyboard. They're yeah. the ones that say F1 through to F12 at the yeah. top of your keyboard. Now, been... a lot of people don't use them, and that's a real shame because they have some really good functionality. Yeah, they've so, been there a very long time. They have. Well. So they have. Pretty much all keyboards. Yeah, have been part of the keyboard ones. shortcuts that most computers will still use regardless of what operating system you're running uh, um, well specifically Windows but regardless of what version of Windows you're running then you'll see that the function keys are always there yeah so let's start off we've got F1 now according to this F1 uh, is used to enter the CMOS and is also used to bring up help screen it's generally help yeah yeah so whatever active window you've got if you hit F1 it'll generally conjure up the, the help button. Yeah, so rather than looking across the top of this toolbar and finding the help button and then clicking on that, you just hit F1 and the help button, the help page will pop up. Yep. Okay. That's really cool. F2. So F2, F2 is, uh, according to this, uh, I don't know which one I use. Uh, it renames an icon, yeah. file, or folder within Windows, right? So you can do a renaming function using F2. Yes. That's pretty handy. good. It's really handy. Very handy indeed. I guess you need to have the folder, or at least the page open, before you can do that, right? Well, you just have it selected. Windows Explorer. Yeah, in Explorer, if you've got it selected, yep. and you hit yeah. F2, you're all of a sudden editing the file. Cool, so you select it, then hit F2, and you can edit the file name. Mm. All right, F3 opens a Windows desktop. According to this, yeah, I don't really use F3 much. No, I haven't got? really used F3 either. Okay, there's a few things. It will repeat the last command. Interesting. In a, in a command line? Yeah. Okay. So if you're using the command prompt which we showed you before when we showed you how to get to your IP of your router, then that's when you'd use F3. Okay, um, F4 opens the address bar in Windows Explorer and Internet Explorer. That's very useful. Repeats the last action performed. Yeah, in Word 2000 onwards. Plus, yeah, yeah. that's interesting. That's very cool. And closes the program with Windows currently active. That's the one that I remember. Alt F4 will kill a program. Right, Alt F4. Mm. Okay, cool. And we'll put up each one of these. Um, when there's something more in, in terms of using a function plus another key, then we'll put that up on the screen for sure. you. So F5. Oh, this is a common one. Will refresh any browser that you've got open. And it yeah. doesn't matter whether it's uh, your Internet Explorer or Google Chrome or Firefox. You hit F5. Yeah, it's the same for all of them. Yeah. yeah. And it refreshes it across all of the browsers, which is very, very useful. Yeah. Especially if you're um, looking at something that completely updates all the time. Mm. Bear in mind, if you hit F5 and refresh when you're logged into a secure session, yep. it'll make you log in again ah. because you, you break that session. That's secure right. Session. That's right. The secure sessions have all sorts of um, privacy settings and uh, security settings that you have to take into account when you're using them. Yep. Okay, F6. F6. Move the cursor to the address bar in Internet Explorer and... Oh, right, so it just moves the cursor to... Right, okay. Didn't know that one. No, I didn't know that one either. That one's an interesting one. What about F7? F7 is uh, spell check. Spell check. So when you're in a yeah. Word document and you want to do a quick spell check, hit F7. And then the spell checker will... Emails to Outlook. Yep, and it will start straight away. 
That's okay. really good. And Shift F7, I'm really ah, right. Shift F7 brings up the thesaurus. So yeah. if you want to use another word instead of the word that you've repeated eight times, then hit <laughs> Shift F7 and it will bring up a thesaurus so you yeah. can choose another word with the same meaning. That's pretty good and pretty useful. Yeah. F8, ah, now F8 normally when you are booting up, when you're first booting up and it says hit F8 to enter safe mode, then uh, that's what it does. So this is basically a, um, a, a boot starter. Safe mode's a way of diagnosing problems. Yeah, really. yeah, yeah, because it doesn't allow you to put lots of, it just allows certain programs to come up rather than all the programs to come up, especially the ones that uh, access the, yeah, access the internet or use drivers. All right, F9. Now, F9 refreshes a document in, win in Word and also if you want to, if you let's say you're using Outlook for your email client and you want to do a quick send receive check, then hit F9 and it will do a quick send receive check right there. Okay. So that's really cool. I actually use that all the time yeah. and it also works on Mac OS 10.3 and later, which is really good. Okay. Okay, so F10. Now, in F10, it activates a menu bar for any open application. So if you've got something open and you want the menu bar to pop up, then you hit F10. Okay. And it pops up. And then Shift F10 is the same as right-clicking on a highlighted icon. So if you've got an icon and you've selected it, then you put Shift F10, and it's the same as right-clicking. Although, I don't know why you wouldn't just right-click. <laughs> yeah, Maybe I'm you don't have a too. mouse. If you don't have a mouse functionality or something's gone wrong, then you can still... Yeah. You can still right click and that's useful, especially if your mouse is dying or like a mouse with one button. Or if you've got a trackpad on your in, on your um, laptop and it's stuffed itself up, which has happened to me before, and mm. I couldn't actually right click and it made me crazy. So Shift F10 will help you do that. Do that. Okay, so now we've got F11. Now this one's a bit F11. Fun. I can show you right here by hitting it. What it does is it makes it go into full screen, so it it hides all the menu bars and everything else around, and it just goes into a complete full screen. So and if you're looking at, you know, if you're reading a long document or something like that, browsing around and you really don't need all the borders, a movie. Uh, well, you can usually full screen, but. It's just a nice a nice way of getting the most out of real estate. Yeah, and to stop that, you just hit F11 again, and obviously all the toolbars appear again down the bottom, as you can see. Yeah. And across the top, all your tabs appear as well. And finally, F12, it says here, it will open, a save, open the save as window in Microsoft Word. So if you want to create a different version of a document that you've just modified, but you want to keep the original, and you want to make several versions, then what you do normally is hit save as, and so hitting F12 will open the save as for you, and um, you can use it. Now, if apparently, if you hit shift F12, it's just like hitting control S, which is just normal save. Okay, great. Yeah. So there's uh, F1 through F12, the function keys. The function keys on your computer that sit on the top, and you probably never use them, when you really, you should. Okay, so that's our indispensable segment for today. We hope you've enjoyed it and found it very useful, as we have and always do. Yeah. And if you have any other queries or questions that you'd like to know about function keys, then please let us know at our Facebook and our YouTube page. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay, thanks everyone. Uh, that's our episode for this week. Uh, contact us, obviously, if you want to know anything further or want to correct us in any way. And you can contact us on our Facebook page or our YouTube channel, and the address should be right about here. And uh, we will see you next week. See you next week. Thank you.